Hello there and welcome to another live chapter reading from Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Today I shall be reading Antipodes by T. S. Simons. My head was throbbing, a piercing stream of white light with dancing flecks of dust struck me full in the eye as I dared to crack one open, forcing me to curl into the fetal position under the blankets to avoid its harsh interrogation, knowing that that to get up and close the curtain would wake me further. I stubbornly refused to acquiesce, desperate for a few more hours of oblivion. The low drone was relentless, reverberating through my skull. Rolling over, I groaned as I recognised the sound. Someone was vacuuming a particularly dirty section of the hallway rug that appeared to be right outside my bedroom door. Sighing, I recognised the masterful handiwork of my mother. Mum derived a perverse sense of pleasure in torturing me when I was sick particularly if it was a self-inflicted variety. The subterranean growl I thought I had heard as I had tried to stealthily sneak in at 3am had tripped over the cat, clearly meant that I had indeed woken her when I had fallen with full force into the hallway wall. Merlin had gleefully recognised someone being awake as breakfast time and had started yowling at the top of his lungs. That cat had no off switch. My choices at that point had been limited clatter around the kitchen and feed him, or have him follow me to bed, purring like a chainsaw, walking on my belly, pushing random items off the chest of drawers until I succumbed. Like all rescue cats, Merlin considers herself a black furry god. Shuffling around the kitchen in the dark, I opened the noisy pet to can. Wafts of tuna atop a belly full of beer and kebab made me gag, so I bolted. Loud rumbles of content echoed as I shuffled up the hallway trying not to wake my family further in that exaggerated one does, way one does when extremely intoxicated. Thus the excruciatingly loud vacuuming at stupid o'clock on a Sunday morning, a quick glance at my watch while trying to, still trying to avoid the light from my window told me that it was 8.05am. Indicated that Mum was not impressed at being woken. Ten minutes later, and Mum still hadn't managed to dislodge a stubborn bit of dirt from outside my room. I recognised the futility in avoiding my fate. Mum had been born and raised in a small community on Lewis, a remote island in the Outer Hebrides off the northwest of Scotland. The determined Scots streak in her had never waned, despite her living here for more than 20 years after she had met my Scots-born Australian-raised dad, while he was backpacking and visiting his own relatives in Scotland. Mum had readily admitted that at the time she was desperate to escape her small island, her small town existence. The occasional subtle dig from my father indicated that Mum had been a wild child and left some carnage in her wake before she met Dad and moved to Australia. Small town living was clearly not suited to her. When we were young, Mum had returned from university and completed her teaching degree, now a principal. I had no doubt that the kids at her primary school were absolutely shit scared of her. Despite her heart of gold and inability to walk past a person, child or animal in need, she still hadn't lost a sharp accent, a serbic wit, nor the ability to reduce a fool stupid enough to take her on, take her on to a withered mass within minutes. If eyes were the window to the soul, they also expressed a spectrum of emotions. Mum possessed an arsenal of rather creative tactics to express her displeasure, nothing as mundane as yelling. As there is no torture worse than lying in bed trying to decide whether to get up and go to the loo or to continue to lie there trying to sleep but desperately needing to pee, I finally got up. Morning! Mum chirped over the vacuum's roar as I staggered past and misjudged the corner, banged my elbow and finally closed the door to the bathroom firmly behind me. Dropping my head, I groaned loudly, my long fringe falling across my face. Torture technique number two had commenced. Excessive chirpiness until I told her where I was last night, who I was with and what I did. At least when she had turned the vacuum off. What are you up to, Campbell, my lad? The prying questions continued as I shuffled from the bathroom to the kitchen, analgesic in hand. Trying to respond but unable to dislodge the dry furry throat without a drink, I ended up grunting a monosyllabic response in her general direction that came out remotely like the desired word of sleep. My sister Saoirse was sitting at the banquet, at the banquet, sitting at the dining table. Her back to the window, she had a cup of coffee in one hand and an empty cereal bowl to the right of the newspaper she was reading. Despite paying bills, shopping and performing most day-to-day -day transactions online, my parents were old school in that they still liked having a weekend paper delivered. 
Facing the kitchen door where I had entered, my sister was engrossed in the paper and barely registered my existence. We had never been close, not since we were young. Contemplating making a cooked breakfast to settle my throbbing head and queasy stomach, I realised that I would need to clean up afterwards. Instead, I settled for toast and coffee. The coffee machine whirred as it ground the beans and I cringed as the noise pierced my skull, making me clutch my head grimacing in pain. Filling a glass of tap water from the tap, I gazed blearily at the painkillers in my hand, wishing they could alleviate the pain by osmosis as I waited for the toaster. Funny how two tiny white tablets could ease so much. Tilting my head back, I dropped them into the back of my throat, washing them down with a gulp of the water. Cup and plate in hand, I finally plonked myself at the table in front in one of the chairs opposite Saoirse. Toast and coffee should be granted official medicinal status, I thought absently. There is absolutely no situation that cannot be improved with the addition of hot buttery toast and strong coffee. Where's Dad? I asked Saoirse between mouthfuls, the coffee starting to revise me into some semblance of humanity. She wrinkled her nose at the interruption but responded without glancing up. The block. Dad had always loved taking us camping. Dad was a different person in the bush, he just blended in. It was like Dad fit somehow, evolving into something different. Dad loved it all, fishing, cooking on open fires, hiking in the mountains, and he had loved teaching us how to be self-sufficient. For years he had refused to own a smartphone, responding with smartphone, dumb user. Nothing could be further than the truth. He had an immense knowledge of medicine, history and obscure topics that made him an interesting man to talk to. Many times I had wondered why he had chosen a career as a paramedic in the city, when he was so clearly better suited to farming or rural life even a career in academia. Dad had immense knowledge and interest in World War I history and had allegedly dragged Mum all over Europe to see historical sites like the Men in Gate, the Somme and Bier Bretonneau on their honeymoon. Despite sharing his love of history and Mum's particular area of interest being Celtic and Pict archaeology, Mum was a city creature. She loved shops, cinemas and people. Mum couldn't stop by the supermarket to buy milk without striking up a conversation with a stranger about some arbitrary topic. Shopping with her was a veritable nightmare as she would try to draw you into the conversation and you ended up being forced to share highly embarrassing anecdotes from your childhood. I had started to refuse to shop with I had started to refuse to shop with her when she regressed to chatting to old people who adopted her as a kindred spirit in the pet food aisle. That whole section between cat food and laundry liquid was a quagmire best avoided. Most years my mum would invite strays to join us at Christmas dinner. Random people, those new to the city with no family. Homeless people that she harassed into coming along. Goodness knows where she found them. Probably buying cat food with a solitary link within in the trolley. The beacon of a lone dweller. Mum could spot a lonely person a mile off. And was the type of person who, if you arrived during dinner, would take a small portion from everyone's plate until she could feed you too. Refusing to get rid of old coats every year, Mum would run a collection donating winter jackets to those in need. Warm, caring, cajoling or blatantly manipulative, Mum had a way of getting what she wanted, but people loved her and said she had a heart of gold. My pounding head, eardrums, still vibrated from the vacuum cleaner noise, wasn't convinced. Saoirse, three years older than I and now in her final year of a postgraduate medical degree and working part-time as a university tutor, claimed she didn't have time to go camping anymore. But the truth is she had never really enjoyed it. She only went as she wanted to please Dad. I had long suspected that he had always known that, but being the eternal diplomat never said a word. He welcomed her and enjoyed her company. He just nodded sagely when she finally plucked up the courage to tell him that she didn't want to spend any more weekends out at our bush block anymore. The block, as we had called it from the time my parents had bought it 12 years ago, was five acres of blue gum and candlebark trees, just over three hours drive from our Melbourne home, quite literally in the middle of nowhere, on the back road to Mount Buller. We had debated the names for hours, arguing over the merits of each, but I couldn't reach a consensus. One finally ended the debate by stating that the property would name itself, and the name would become apparent when it was time. It hadn't. Now it was just too embarrassing to try. I had long suspected that no one else wanted the particular piece of bushland when my parents had bought it dead cheap at the end of a dirt track over a kilometre off the nearest road and surrounded by state forest. I was 11 when they had bought it, old enough to roam the forest for hours on a trail bike during my school holidays and long weekends, making slingshots, climbing trees and enjoying bushfires at night with toasted marshmallows. For Dad, it was his nirvana and he loved being there like nowhere else on earth. Despite all the years we had owned it, the block was still mostly covered in bush with a small two-room cottage we had built from scratch. 
Surrounded by a forest of eucalyptus and soaring tree ferns, bracken and ground cover over the past few years, Dad had begun more clearing and started planting a mixed orchard, as well as a decent-sized vegetable patch. He was still wondering how, working out what grew well and what didn't. Keeping a local wildlife on snacking was an ongoing issue, requiring creative fencing solutions. Wallagrees, wombats and koalas, even deer regularly came to help themselves to dinner. The possums got most of the cherries, even with the sheets of metal clad around their trunks to hinder their climbing. So after two seasons of failure, he finally gave up with them, letting the possums have them. There was no point in ripping them out after all. Stone fruit grew well, but he simply couldn't get lemons to grow. Finally, Mum and said acerbically, You could have bought a lot of lemons with the money you spent on citrus trees, you can. Dad had rolled, to his, rolled his eyes and said nothing, but I noted that he stuck to stone fruit after that. Unable to describe why, but I loved it there so much. Like Dad, I felt a bond, a connection. The peace of the bush, the sounds of the light birds calling, the wind in the trees. I always felt a lingering sense of sadness when I left. Seated at the kitchen table, food in my stomach, I pondered what to do with my Sunday. My head was still throbbing from adventures the previous night, when I had celebrated my 23rd birthday with my agricultural science friends from Melbourne University. Although I wasn't a huge fan of noisy clubs, I knew that I needed to do what normal people did, and so went along with the plan. I was in my honours year now, and contemplated what to do next. Look for a job, postgrad study, or my usual course of action, wait and see what landed in my lap. We had been back at university for a week, and I had enjoyed catching up with friends and acquaintances after the summer holidays, before knuckling down to my thesis. Most of us had jobs to help fund the reality of tertiary study, I considered myself lucky that I still lived at home and didn't pay rent or bills, but working part-time at a wholesale plant nursery helped provide a much-needed source of disposable income. It was a staff discount that Dad regularly put to good use. Working with plants was therapeutic and one of the reasons I was seriously contemplating a career in global food security. Despite not really knowing how to make the idea a reality, time for those decisions in a few months. Last night there had been copious amounts of alcohol consumed and the obligatory late night kebab on my way home. Glancing down at my empty coffee cup, I pondered the merits of a second. Social looked up from the newspaper, belatedly acknowledging my existence, and asked if I had seen the news. My general policy was to avoid the news as I found it highly political and thus boring. Shaking my head in negation, I knew where this was going. She had the look. The derisive way her eyes narrowed and nostrils flared indicated she was about to launch into yet another monotonous academic lecture about the merits of obscure scientific theory, spotlighting her vast medical training while simultaneously proving beyond doubt to the world at large that I was a complete moron. To my surprise, instead of lecturing me, she saw she folded back the paper to expose the front page. A large headline loomed at me. Unknown virus kills hundreds. Squinting through my headache, I scanned the lightly blurred first paragraph. An unknown epidemic was spreading across several countries in Europe, killing people, animals, aquatic life and plants. Continued on page three. Looking up, I shrugged at her. So? Don't you get it? She sneered, unable to contain her incredulousness. In the space of 15 seconds, I had proven myself to be the cretin she evidently believed I was. You do study biology, right? Remind me to have a chat with Carter about reviewing your grades. Well, clearly not to the same level as you, Dr. McIntosh, I retorted. Planning to enlighten me? Rolling her eyes in exaggerated exasperation, she adopted the tone one uses when speaking to a child or an idiot. But both in this case, apparently. I wondered if she had talked to her recalcitrant students about like this, doubting it would have much effect on them either. The virus is in the water, she explained very slowly, so the stupid among us could catch on. Okay, I replied hesitantly. So? <sighs> it is spreading. Ra so she snipped, sniped caustically. Rapidly. Okay, but it is in Europe, I countered sarcastically. Not exactly next door. Surely it can be contained. That is precisely the problem. How do you contain something in waterways? The World Health Organization is saying that it started in the Danube. Within a few weeks, it is killing people all over Europe. Did you not learn about brown in motion at school? You know, particles suspended in liquid spend, spread and move randomly. Sure, but then it dilutes, right? Well, that is where this one is different. This epidemic, they are calling it the Vienna virus, by the way, because that is where the first known death occurred. It seems to multiply and scientists can't yet work out how. There are hundreds of people dead already and many more than that infected. None of them survive once infected. 
desperately wanting to needle her, I really didn't have the energy. Look, I get that. I need to read the article, but tell me the basics. I mean, we have survived swine flu, avian flu, SARS. How is it, bad is it really? I asked this time more kindly. Glancing back at the paper, she read 2,850 kilometres of waterways and crossed it into 11 countries. If it spreads into all those countries, waterways, and eventually into the ocean, it will end up in the Black Sea. Well, that isn't too bad, is it? I counted my limited geographical kicking in. Isn't the Black Sea the one that's fully contained? Nope, the Black Sea is navigable to the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, the word came out like a deflating tyre. I really had nothing to say to that. I sat and looked at Saoirse, dumbfounded. Some critics are saying that this is a Malthusian theory in practice. Scratching my still aching temple, I tried to recall who Malthus was, not wanting to appear a bigger idiot in front of my drug gentle sister. That was a guy that said the population tends to increase at a faster rate than its ability to feed itself, right? That's him. He also says that unless the population is kept in check by moral restraint like celibacy or by disease, famine, war or natural disaster, then the population, the population will continue to experience widespread poverty and would never achieve utopia. Happy bloke, I commented cheerily. Must have been great fun at dinner parties. The door to the kitchen opened and Mum backed in, dragging the vacuum behind her. As she turned it on and roared into life, this effectively prevented any further conversation. So she returned to the newspaper and I decided a second cup of coffee was warranted. The noise no longer an impediment, going back to bed wasn't really an option, nor was continuing to enjoy Mum's interrogation. Years of experience told me that she was by no means finished with me. Mum finished up the floors in the kitchen as I was steaming the milk, wiping down machine after years of being nagged into cleaning up as I went. I watched Mum move into the lounge room and I firmly closed the door behind her, sitting down with my now full steaming cup and placed the second in front of Saoirse. She looked at me with surprise but smiled her thanks. Saoirse sat in silence for several more minutes before she looked up again. Where are you going? Well, are you going? Going where? Another loud and overly exaggerated sigh responded before pushing the paper in front of me. A half-page advertisement. My head still hurt and I couldn't focus my eyes on the slightly blurred fine print so I pushed it back. Call me stupid, but summarise it for me. Sasha rolled, Sasha rolled her eyes. This is everywhere. Papers, TV, email through the university faculty. I must have received it six times already. Don't you have a phone? Check your email. The light bulb went off in my head, remembering that my phone had gone flat the previous night. I stood and picked it up from the bench where I dropped it with my wallet and keys the night before and plugged it in. Within seconds, the distinct pinging sounds of messages, email and SMS were reverberating around the kitchen. Just tell me, I wheezed with exaggerated drama as I fell back into the chair opposite Saoirse. Saoirse took a deep breath and read. It is an official announcement, Commonwealth Department of Innovation and Science. They are seeking people to attend a briefing at their main site in Melbourne. Very specific skills, set age ranges, and you need to register online. Miss Reed in the queues, I asked, do you want to go together? I'm busy, she snapped. I have a class to teach at nine o'clock. You don't have classes until the afternoon, so you should go and see what all this is about. You meet the criteria, well, apart from the not being an idiot part, which they neglected to mention as a deal breaker. So you go, then you can call me. There are multiple session times anyway. I'll go to the evening one if it isn't wasting my time. Ignoring her taunt, I clicked on the link in one of my countless messages, registering my expression of interest. An automated reply pinged back, noting my booking for a bus was departing the university campus at 8.30am. Excellent, I can go and be back in time for my afternoon class. I hope you enjoyed the reading, and if you did, I hope you go and check out the book. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.